Well, um, here is an overdue guess. Most of my guests are overdue because they should have been on the podcast a lot long, a lot earlier than they actually are. But this one in particular has been on the on the radar for quite a while. We've had lots of conversations in a professional setting, but we never really managed to be able to record any of them for the podcast. And there's far too much gold from from this fine fellow. But anyway, Tom Hartley, welcome belatedly to the Talent Equation. Thanks, Stuart. Nice to be a guest at long last. Um. I mean, one of the reasons, if not um, many of the reasons I've been really keen to have you on is you're, you are or certainly were very prolific on Twitter and in general would either share some really fascinating insights or, or ask really poignant questions that I always think, God, that's such a good question. Why didn't I think to ask that question? But anyway... Um, I know you're more than just a Twitter personality, so I wonder if you wouldn't mind just telling the story, like, you know, how did you, your journey, the things that you've done, the places that you've been, how you got involved in coaching in the first place, all of that good stuff. By the way, I have a tendency to go off on lots of different rambles with this stuff. Well, so you and me both, we're in real trouble. Stop me. <laughs> stop me. And by the way, since Twitter became X and all the algorithms have changed, mm. it's, uh, it's changed my uh, changed my engagement level, that's for sure. It's a um, pool, isn't it? Yeah. So, so my rocky road, my journey to where I am now, um, I didn't go to university. I made the very deliberate choice when I was about 17, 18 years old that I wanted to have loads of experiences in an applied nature in coaching. And football was always my always my go-to. I'm a Swindon Town fan. I was eight years old when I got taken to my first ever football match and Swindon went up to the Premier League, the dizzy heights. And I knew from that moment onwards, working in football was where I wanted to be, whether that's a coach or a player or whatever, whatever it was. And uh, I got to about 16 years old and realised I wasn't going to make it in a playing capacity. And I think everybody else realised that a few years previous, but neglected to tell me. Um, and, and coaching was always the obvious thing to go and do. So um, I studied my A-levels. I got my basic coaching qualifications and I started to try some stuff out. And I was really fortunate that the the, co- the people who ran the Community Foundation at Swindon had an open door. And, and I went in and they were almost my very first unofficial mentors or supporters. And uh, I didn't really realize it at the time, but they just created an environment where they made me feel really welcome and they put the, the support around me in terms of more experienced coaches and some kids to go and coach that gave me the chance to go and practice my practice. And I spent lots of really happy years at Swindon where um, I started to do some work in their academy and their community set up. I just learned loads from being kind of on the ground and, and out and about. But for me, the the driver at that point was how do I make this something that that, that pays the bills, um, and becomes a profession and becomes a job. And like it felt in football, it probably feels like it still now that full time jobs in football are certainly gold dust, and accessing those jobs is a matter of what you know or who you know, where you are, and being in the right place at the right time, and a whole host of other things. Um, But after working on some different projects and having the opportunity to go and do a bit of coaching in the States, um, a job came up at the FA and uh, they just set up a new program called the FA Skills Program, which was sponsored by a big supermarket. uh, And they would just recruited 65 coaches to to start this program, Uh, but they had resource for 66. And I happened to bump into somebody who said, oh, there's one position to fill in Hampshire. You're quite close to there, aren't you? And I just happened to be in the right place to have a conversation uh, with a chap called Nick Levette, who we both know, um, and and Les Harry, who was head of grassroots at the FA at the time. And uh, we got an interview set up and, and then the rest really was history. I spent 10 years at the FA and I still reflect on that time as it was a 10 year apprenticeship program. Um, I had the best time being a coach and working with, in school groups club settings, and then our own skill centers, which was like your um, alternative development pathway, which sat outside of academy structures. Um, and it was great. So when the FA developed new qualifications aimed at coaching young people, we were almost the guinea pigs for that. We had actual time in our working week to plan and reflect on our practice rather than just being paid to deliver stuff and be on this hamster wheel of 
churning out session after session. And you were part of this big community of coaches across the country, which got to about 120 at its at its height, um, which was doing really awesome stuff for kids. And it was based in primary school setting. We were doing things alongside teachers as well, because ultimately they were the experts of pedagogy and we were coming in with knowing a bit about football. I always felt that working alongside teachers was really powerful because you could you could bring together the skills of, of, of two two professions which were very related but from slightly different worlds. And yeah, yeah, I spent 10 years there, worked in a few different roles. First experience of leading a team in coaching as well, which was really interesting too. Um, and also the thing that really struck me from the FA when I think back about it was the county FA structure that exists in football and how the FA skills programme was a national football programme, but it really came to life through the local partnerships and what the skills programme looked like in Oxfordshire or Hampshire or Lincolnshire um, had the same guiding principles but met a different local need and it was really a, a privilege to work alongside county FAs because they knew their context better than anybody else so you're able to better take what kind of was true to the program putting children first but then blend it with we're really focusing on this group right now of grassroots coaches and we want to help them uh so yeah 10 years at the FA and I was ready for a change um, and the thing that I was really missing was the opportunity to go and take some of the things I'd learned, especially around working in these different environments, but how the, the, the environments of schools and clubs and player development pathways were all connected, um, but, but apply it. So I went to Arsenal, uh, worked for Arsenal Women for, for three and a half years, and I definitely did about seven years work in the three and a half years, uh, such as the nature of being in that type of environment. But it was it was fast paced uh what, what what's the, what's the expression uh you try stuff fail fast and and learn quickly um and we we did some really exciting work when, when i was at arsenal so we we developed our player development pathway it was all about the experience for the girls we wanted we had some principles around wanting every girl to love the game that was like the number one thing um we wanted the experience to feel like the the coach the girls met when they came into our se sessions was the best coach they've ever had. So we spent lots of time with the coaches in our workforce talking about well, what does that mean then? Like, what is the experience of a child if they are coming to sessions with their best coach ever? Um, and what we wanted to do was um, move as well as supporting the kids to have a great time, work with the coaches in their grassroots clubs. So we raised the water level. So every experience that child has, whether it's with Arsenal or, or their grassroots club, was just a bit better than it was maybe last year or the year before that. Um, and it also gave me the opportunity to go off and coach um, around the world and, and experience what coach development looked like in the middle of nowhere in Spain where nobody spoke English. And we spent a week delivering coach education and stuff for the players uh, with Google Translate, which was certainly a uh, developmental experience. Um, I could order a beer in the evening. That was about it, really. Uh, through to going off to, to North America and to Canada, doing some work over there. It was great. There was just, just this like rich collection of experiences. The richest experience I had at Arsenal was coaching in prison. Um, so the ex-vice chairman of Arsenal Football Club, a chap called David Dean, set up a, a project called the Twinning Project. And the ambition of the Twinning Project was to link football club with its local prison use football as a vehicle to have an impact on reducing reoffending, and like that's a world I never imagined working in but realized quite quickly that you're working with people who have had a radically different journey to you and uh you, you can't go into that space being judgmental or holding too firmly onto the beliefs around the prison system so I went into a HMP Downview, which is a women's prison in South London, about 60 times. And football was the vehicle for loads of other stuff. And did it have an impact on reducing reoffending? I, I really don't know. But what I do know is that we built relationships with people who struggled to build relationships with men, um, who had really negative experiences of learning. And we did stuff that, if nothing else, made the time that they had in prison slightly more bearable and 
slightly more than just doing their time. Um, yeah, so there's a whole world of stuff in there. And then um, following on from Arsenal, I joined UK Coaching back at the beginning of COVID. And I've spent four and a half years now to date at UK Coaching in a few different roles. One is um, a coach developer role supporting the development of people who help coaches. So tutors, assessors, coach developers, that type of, that type of person. Um, in a role directly working with coaches through some of the work we've done with UK Sport and coaches working across Olympic and Paralympic sports. And then um, leading, the, leading the coaching team at UK Coaching and, and as well as doing the doing and being quite applied, we're still working uh, directly with coaches in their context, um, trying to join the dots to make the work that we do more sustainable, whether that's on a community level or, 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 or through to a performance level. But I think with UK Coaching, it was one of those moments where my learning curve coming to the organization was really steep. Um, I felt like a peak idiot when I stepped in the door. It's almost like all, all that stuff I've been work, done over the last 20 years in football. I just realized that I knew absolutely nothing. Um, the, someone who I did a podcast with a few years ago called Damien Hughes, and he takes the Dunning-Kruger model of like expertise and confidence, uh, and he calls like that low in experience but high in confidence peak idiot then moving into the valley of humilities you realize that you know you know some stuff but you're not there yet and then the hill of knowledge and i feel like i've got to a point now where i'm moving between the humble valley and the hill of knowledge recognizing that every conversation i have with a sport or a coach or a coach developer like i'm learning something all the time it's great um i remember one of my an, a, early conversations with some coaches at UK coaching. We had a canoeing coach and a basketball coach on the same community of practice. And we were talking about their role supporting athletes in competition. And the um the basketball coach was saying, look, I'm I'm intrinsic to the game. I call timeouts. And then in those timeouts I'm providing information and making changes. And that they were an active participant in competition where the canoeing coach was saying, well I'll say goodbye. And they disappear and I'm not there for the rest of the race. So I'm, my the shape of my coaching sessions is totally different because I'm coaching for redundancy. And I, I had that moment of stepping back from the screen thinking, wow, yeah. And what does that mean for like, trying to join the dots back into my world as a football coach? And actually, when do I need to be a bit more like a canoeing coach? And when do I need to lean into being a bit more like a basketball coach? I think one of the things that I constantly reflect on is, and I use football as my sense making because that's my home sport but what would football like look like if it had a little bit more of say a skate park culture around coaching or peer-to-peer -peer learning should we say or could could football could the role of the coach in football just look and feel different if it was an individual sport and we weren't allowed to coach in competition how would that change my team talks at half time or my pre-match pre-match work with with, with players so yeah, um, I've been so fortunate, Stuart, over the last 20 or so years in coaching to have such a wide variety of experiences working at lots of different levels. And um, yeah, every every day is a learning opportunity for me. Wow, that, um, that wasn't rambling at all. And um, it was, in fact, extremely coherent and a lovely description of the journey. Um, as usual, I've got like a million different areas I want to probe. Um, something you said, um, I like this notion of the peak idiot because it, I think it resonated. <laughs> I think that's how I spent most of my my career, and I'm still there. I think. Um, but um, when you talked about this idea of feeling as if you know you're on this like really steep learning curve, what was it about going to UK coaching that? made you feel as if you were on such a steep learning curve because your experiences were extremely rich and i would argue in some cases sort of atypical you know particularly when you talk about you know your kind of early experiences in the community foundation coupled then with 10 years practical application as you know a skills coach and then working through an academy you know that's a really broad already that's a very broad cv in terms of different experiences in different parts of the pathway and so to feel like such a novice seemed mm. sort of odd. Yeah, there were definitely a few imposter moments, and maybe it was because you were—I was mixing with people who were just from 
a different world to me. Like my relationship with academia has probably been on and off through mm. through my journey as a coach. I I am studying a master's at the moment around early years education, and the the, the content stuff's helpful, obviously, but the exposure to learning to learn about using research to inform your coaching practice is the really important thing for me. But then suddenly finding yourself in a room with lots of people who work in universities and not necessarily feeling like I fit in that group was definitely something that created a spike in feeling like peak idiot. Um, and maybe, maybe there's something for lots of coaches in this, like stepping away from your own environment for a second, being able to give yourself a helicopter view of, those experiences that you've had and then how that does qualify you for being in certain bit for exploring your practice in different ways and stepping into different environments. Um, it, it gave me a chance to zoom out, but maybe I got some vertigo by zooming out um, because I wasn't used to being at that kind of flying height and thinking about things in a different way. Um, and I, I remember really vividly when I, when I was applying for the job at UK coaching, my stepdad said to me, well, what do you know about badminton or cross or hockey? I was like, I don't know, not much, really. And he's like, well, how, how are you going to help a coach in that sport? And I think the, the thing that I can articulate a lot more clearly now than I could then is that the uh, aside from the technical, tactical specificity of your sport, there's so much shared challenge opportunity learning experience in coaching and for coaches like it there, there are of course lots of contextual differences for lots of different reasons depending on the age group you're working with or what the what the intent of the work that you do is but when i speak to coaches on in in my job from different sports they face similar challenges they in many respects they just need someone to talk to um and to vent not vent or just just have a have it be listened to really well um so the support that you can offer to coaches doesn't have to be knowing more than them actually by putting yourself in a position where you're doing work together i think is quite a uh, enabling thing no i mean i i i've said this quite quite a lot that i think often not having any technical knowledge or even tactical knowledge of the domain then means it, it, it can be a significant advantage because you're not tempted to drift into that space, um, which would be easy to do because if you're interested in that domain, then you would want to talk about it and coaches want to talk about those sorts of things. If you haven't got that, then you tend to center on other things um, which in many cases are probably more important because they are often things that drive other things. So for example, um, I know a coach developer who's known, we know Rusty, who we know both, who was working with, I think it was a rowing coach. And I think the question that he asked was like something just through curiosity, you know, why, why, why do you keep your shoes in the boat? It was something like that. I can't remember. It was something along those lines. And they'd never thought of it. They'd never mm -hmm. thought of that before because it was just such a normalized thing. Now, that's one example of just a particular aspect of, you know, the doing. But likewise, very often, the thing that uh, people are always challenged by, uh, for example, is a, like, why do you do anything that you do the way that you do it? Which is a question we were talking about before we were recording. And that's a question a lot of people have never even considered. And to just go on a really lovely journey of exploration to talk about the ways in which people operate, why they operate the way they do, and to fundamentally get to the bottom of their purpose, if you like, their reason for being, what their what their you know what what, what their drivers and motivations are, can sometimes be really revelatory and very rarely happen. Absolutely, there's a um, person I know who you probably know as well called Dean Clark, based at mm. Harper University, and he described himself to me as a professional idiot. And I, I, I feel like that sometimes stepping into sports, which are a few worlds away from what feels like home. And, and it, it's, it, you can ask questions that just unlock stuff because you are seeing things from a different perspective. I, I'm 
into a book at the moment called The Great Mental Models. And it talks at the start of the book about three things that could get in the way of, but you could flip it to could, could enable learning to take place. And it talks about proximity, ego, and perspective. And and the, the ego piece is an interesting one. I think sometimes it plays out in lots of different domains that people spend time inflating or protecting it. Um, but the perspective one is massive. So it's impossible to really see a situation from every single perspective on your own. Um, being curious and open and asking questions and moving away from something being right or wrong to looking at it from a variety of different perspectives or different viewpoints is huge. And like one of the things that I discovered during my time here at UK Coaching was some of some research around influences on coach learning. And I suppose if you reflect on it, why do you coach the way that you do? Well, you may rely on some of the experiences you had of being coached yourself. Um, some of the things you're perhaps shown on coach education and maybe what other coaches do near you in your club. Um, but if you've been in the same sport or the same environment for an extended period of time, it's probably really difficult to think about approaching it differently because you feel safe in what you do. And and how do you know it's a, you don't know what you don't know? And actually, I think one of the things I love about being in a role that hopefully is helpful for coaches is that you might be able to ask a question or just share something that might feel a little bit disruptive from another point of view that just sends them down a pathway that, that they hadn't even thought of before. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that, that, they're the moments I think of kind of almost like serendipitous epiphany uh, that you almost have together that, you know, mm. like you don't necessarily know there's no plan. You're not necessarily trying to guide someone in that direction. You're just, you just arrive there and there's great moments. I mean, I've had similar moments in coaching. You know, where by taking a particular perspective, a particular position, not position, particular approach, which is not to be the knower, you know, not to be the imparter of knowledge and the solution giver, but to be the kind of like uh, explorer, the, the sort of slightly guidey explorer. What if we went in this direction? What if we went in this direction? What if we did this? What if we shaped things that way? And then seeing moments of epiphany that people have that like i didn't expect and they didn't expect but they're powerful and lasting those things are i'll be honest with you quite addictive <laughs> i quite i like sort of like search for them now a bit <laughs> we, we had a coach on one of our programs a couple of years ago and he explained the experience of having a coach developer a little like someone holding on to you while you lean over the edge so it gave you the opportunity to, to go and experiment with things try stuff out but have some security in the way that you do it rather than just being seen as radical and disruptive and i thought the analogy was really really helpful and for me helps frame the type of relationship you can have with a coach when you're supporting them and i think sometimes uh chris in my chris in in the coaching team at uk coaching used to do some work with boxing and um explain once he met met kind of a professional boxer who who asked him what he did and he said I'm a coach developer and the response was along the lines of well what the f is that um and it's almost a case and I see that sometimes within like when when you're introduced to a coach they kind of know your job title but they don't really know what you do so being able to establish this is different from maybe your experience of being on a course or with a tutor who is signing you off from something this is genuinely about support and discovery uh, Emily, who's in our coaching team as well, she she said something quite profound the other week around when she's working with a coach. It's not about the coach's work. It's about our work that we do together. And I think in a similar respect, how a coach and an athlete, their learning is really connected because what the athlete does would then inform what the coach does next week. And there's a, there's a cycle that happens. I think there's a similar type of uh, relationship between coach and coach developer but there there's a dance between them and yeah absolutely if you can be the I, I like the phrase like coaching companion because it for me takes away some of the hierarchy that might come with a title of a role um that yeah we, we're on the journey together but we are we're seeing different things yeah like so the, often people talk about mentor but for me mentor evoke knowledgeable other 
that has lots and lots of experience and all this. It doesn't have to be that, by the way, but it's, it evokes that, doesn't it? Whereas companion is more someone who is, I often use this term, guide by the side. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Rusty earlier. I think Rus R I've heard Rusty describe himself as a helper. Mm. Um, and yeah, uh, someone else who I came into contact with who does some su work supporting coaches over in Australia would describe himself as a thinking partner. He said, well, there's sometimes where I'm sat next to you in the car and there's sometimes where I'm in the back seat, and there's sometimes I'm not in the car at all. But just by being there, you're a resource. Um, yeah, and I think sometimes when coaches start to understand the type of relationship they could have with someone who could support them, and I appreciate mm -hmm. a coach developer role is a bit of a premium because having people who can work directly with you on a one-to-one -one basis doesn't necessarily appear for many coaches, but I'm sure every coach listening to this could think of the person they might go and lean on when, when they're experiencing a, a challenging moment or a really good moment. Um, in many respects, they're a companion for you. Yeah. I mean, we, I, I, um, I've often thought, and in fact, it's one of the areas that I'm very keen to sort of build upon, uh, is how we can establish these ideas of coach development as a, as a kind of construct and embed it within, um, whatever forms of coach education that there are the reason being is i think a lot of people end up being kind of informal coach developers by virtue of the fact that they're in you know they have they're in an environment and there's others who are less experienced that they're working alongside in a, either in a super they're either being supervised by or they're learning from informally and how we can develop the skills in people to do that in a variety of different ways you know there's lots of different approaches to that some of it can be a, lot, a bit more instructional some of it can be a bit more directive some of it can be more questioning some of it can be more exploratory and um helping helping others on their journey almost like reaching back uh and and i think that's something that would benefit all the whole coaching community a this idea that um supporting others on their developmental journey is part of your uh is part of being a coach coaching others to coach is part of being a coach as well as coaching practice participants but equally um supporting and giving others that leg up because like how, you know i imagine you described at the start of this that when you went to the community foundation at swindon as a relatively inexperienced individual who just says, I want to help out, can I help out? You were given a really supportive environment that I imagine without that probably wouldn't have given you the kind of then springboard to go on to do the other things. So the fortune that you managed to find an environment like that, that's going to be supportive where you've essentially got coach developers wrapped around you, albeit not with the formal title, you're just surrounded by coach development and coaching conversations. If we could afford that to more people, either by the people around them affording that and creating that environment, or by access to others who are available for people to engage with, I just think, what, what would that do to the world of coaching? It would probably feel like a less daunting place to be, and in actual fact, would probably feel like a great place to be, which then, from the perspective of recruitment, retention, um, et cetera, would potentially be really quite transformative for coaching. I think you said to me once around a cultural expectation. Oh, yeah. Coaches oh. who are <laughs> good words, strong words. Oh, it's it's uh, <laughs> a good articulation. But yeah, like the of course there are many ways in which like that support structure could come about in coaching. But I would, if when I reflect on my experiences, especially early in my journey, I think I was uh, fortunate to have a series of happy accidents where I ended up in environments that felt really supportive, where I could learn and there were people to go and talk to. Mm. Um, I think within some of the work we're doing at UK Coaching, if there are people who get lent on by coaches, how do we help them like with the, the tools and resources around them to be as good as they can be 
at supporting those around them. And I think you hit on a massive point there about making it a great place to be. Like, uh, and I, I hear stories around coaches maybe feeling like they're a bit of a commodity within their environment mm-hmm. or their sport. Um, and if we were to flip that in contrast, if how how do we help coaches feel like they're a really valued member of the community and recognising that we can have some people or structures or systems that are just there to help them and the system becomes one which is about appreciation and development and community rather than maybe some of the pain points that coaches experience at the moment, people would stick around for longer and probably get better, enjoy it more, and therefore the kids they coach would have a better experience themselves. Yeah, I, I that point about commodity, I think, is one that really resonates. Heard that a lot. You know, doing research into coaching experiences and coaching motivations, and you know, kind of, you hear this notion of um, being almost, you know, kind of used, I suppose, in many ways. And I don't think it's a willful. It's not used in the sense of like people are willfully just using people to meet their needs. I think it's more of a benign neglect. You know, I, I think about so. I took over as the chair of my club recently, well, actually recently, a few years ago. Um, and I, the first thing I did, obviously, being a workforce development person, a coaching development person, was said to the committee, right, who have we got coaching all of our seconds next year? And there was just like blank faces. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Have we not got some kind of a matrix or something that basically tells us who we've got, what they're, you know, kind of what they're, background is and what their training or qualification level if they've got that is and all of those sorts of things have we got everything covered again blank faces so you know start to do a little bit of work and you know map out across the eight or nine different sessions for different age groups and adults and everybody else you know there was there was very little of it was green which meant we've got somebody that we know is going to be reliable and appropriately trained and you know equipped to do the job with that audience group and everybody else was just kind of whoever else so there was a lot of green very very little green a little bit of orange and a lot of red Mm. and for me i was like do you not see that this is an enormous risk because for a number of reasons one um we might not be able to put on the session for the people who are members of the club that they deserve two we're not sure of the quality of those sessions and three what if some of those sessions are absolutely terrible like that's not going to be great reputationally and it's certainly not going to be great for the experience of the individual. But it's like that no one had ever thought about that. They'd not actually considered that they as a committee were responsible for the best possible experience, not just for the participants, but for the practitioners. Because then the other thing that came to light was that what you ended up having was the same people just doing a lot of a lot of coaching um, because there was no one else to do the coaching. And then them feeling overwhelmed, overburdened, burnt out, like a means to an end, being used. And it's it's not necessarily because anybody on the committee had ever gone, oh, let's just really use this individual. It was, we don't know what else to do. And Mm -hmm. we don't know how to do it any differently. Uh, And if I'm totally honest, their focus tended to be on collecting in the membership fees more than it did on and paying the bills, more than it did on providing great experiences. Mm. And one thing I hope I've managed to get across to them is providing great experiences for your coaches and for your participants actually pays you back if you only care about the money because more people come to your club. So you get more membership revenues. That's not about that. But it is, it's a happy accident that actually a focus on your workforce and a focus on the experiences they provide happens to grow your club base, which then helps you put out more teams. It helps you put teams out on the weekend when everyone's struggling to. It helps your your, your, your club get better because you've got more players to select from, blah, 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 blah. Totally. If, if you position it that you'll affect the participant experience through the coach and then affect the coach experience through the support that you put around them, the opportunity for growth is absolutely massive. And if you do it... If you don't do a great job, then people aren't going to come back tomorrow. Um, I, I wonder as well, like from the, the fast and f- furious nature of what community and grassroots sports can sometimes feel like, it's really difficult to be able to take a breath, 
to like really look at the depth chart of coaches you might have in your system and work out like who's coming through next to be able to do the work that we need to do and like what what you said takes me takes my mind off to a few different experiences and places when I was working at Arsenal we had a player development program which was it ran alongside the academy and provided like this opportunity for girls to play in their grassroots club whilst having additional support from us um and because it was Arsenal we would attract quite a big volume of kids to come along and we needed a, a good high high quality coaching team to be able to a be available but b deliver stuff that w- the kids would want to come back and back for so i intentionally over recruited and always had one or two additional coaches almost like your uncle doctor so they wouldn't necessarily need to be there at, at there on the monday night practice but mm-hmm. if a coach couldn't make it or if there was a certain problem they were available to step in and there were some really nice unintended consequences of doing some work like that because the coaches who were there felt like that burden of responsibility which was on their shoulders was eased slightly because they knew that if they had a life challenge that there was always someone available to to step in and and we we built to that over a period of time but i i would say it was um something that contributed towards a really positive coaching culture within our little group of coaches because they recognized that there was there was an understanding of, of them as people rather than just come in deliver the session get paid for two hours and then go home again um yeah it, it's it, it's huge and and it gave us the opportunity to then start to connect in coaches who we think might be there for next year and and give mm. them the opportunity to hit the ground running with, with the work that they did so yeah i i hear you completely in terms of factoring su- the, the way that you succession plan into your club development that is, is, is critical I'm, I'm feeling it at the moment with a, a girls emerging talent center where i i do some work at the moment um it's really difficult to attract coaches to come in because it's an hour and a half a week and and the, the pay isn't great so i'm thinking about how do we change the experience for people who are part of this club it's got to be more than the amount of money they earn from it and the more than just the 90 minutes they do if they feel like they can genuinely get better by being part of the environment then they'll probably want to come and work here so it's a slow slow change in relationship with coaches someone who we just employ to coach as someone we really help yeah i mean when you've got that sort of brand name like arsenal i i, I can imagine that the recruitment challenge was probably less less so because people wanted to be part of it because they saw it as an opportunity to rub shoulders with other coaches that they would either learn from or develop from and also it's attractive to those coaches I imagine to be associated with a name like Arsenal whereas when you're working in a more community type setting or a grassroots setting you haven't got that to offer so Mm. I suppose you have to then make the experience and then people talking about the experience, the thing that then people are attracted towards. Yes, absolutely. Um, I suppose that we, we weren't short of people wanting to work in the environment, but it mm-hmm. was more about then trying to identify and select the coaches who we think would have the biggest impact in the environment. Um, mm. Something you said earlier, especially when it's difficult perhaps finding the right coaches to come into your club something that i would want to pay attention to was who's great at working with children rather than who's got a great knowledge of football would probably be a primary driver for bringing someone in because ultimately with the right experience and the right support around them all the football stuff will just come in time Mm. but working with kids is is massive we i was at a, a meeting not so long ago and um uh, someone was reflecting on real high quality coaching in community and youth settings and, and they just highlighted, well, surely the best coaches at this stage are, are ultimately got lots of the skills and the qualities of really good youth workers, but with sport as a vehicle to do stuff and some extra tech tap things around the edge. And I see that completely, that, that coaches don't just deal in designing practices and delivering them, they're dealing with the whole person who steps into their coaching session. So that coach who can listen really well and know when to individualize stuff or not to lean in and lean out. Um, 
and build those relationships with the players beyond the football stuff. Like it's massive. One of the biggest influences on my journey is a is a football coach called Peter Sturges, who led a lot at the FA. And I I, I always like imagine myself like in the shoes of a ten year old receiving coaching from Pete. What it must be like. And like he's such a he's such a Jedi at being able to create rapport in a in a really caring way, but also still deliver some really high quality football messages at the same time. He's almost got two truths in the same hand. It's football and it's people. <laughs> That's really cool. Two truths in the same hand. Um yeah, Pete. Uh, Pete, who won Lifetime Achievement Award at the UK Coaching Awards, if I remember correctly, from a very good yeah. evening last year. Um, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Um, I have had the privilege to observe him in action only once, actually, um, and I could definitely resonate with that notion of the connection almost being the primary driver before the activity. Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. Um I watched Pete, Pete coach once and I remember how intentional he was about wel- welcoming kids into the session and asking them a question about their interests or their day and then how he was really skillful in reconnecting with whatever they said at some point later in the session when he needed to go and coach them. It, oh, what you're experiencing now is a bit like when Sonic gets stuck on that level mm. and, and just this this real, this real masterful an ease of being able to just link the 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 world of a child with what you're trying to go after in your football session. Mm, love that, love that. I, I the other person who you've made me think of who does that really well. It goes back to Rusty, but it's actually his partner in crime, or at least I've seen them do this. They both do this really well, so I'm not saying Rusty doesn't. But John Fletcher. Um, who is his sort of alter ego within the Magic Academy. I've watched them co-coach a number of times and like they're very intentional about that. So one one of them is managing the activity and the other one is then responsible for connections. So they'll be like walking through the activity, talking to the players, asking them like, you know, what's their what's their favourite football team and did they watch? Did they see the um, the performance by Coldplay in at, uh, at Glastonbury the other week, or whatever it might be? Whatever they wherever they can create some form of connection, they'll create the connection, and then build off that when they swap roles or when you know they're in in activities. Yeah, there's a real skill to it, and I think that mm. co-coaching piece is is when you really get into it, really quite um, a difficult thing to do really well that mm. requires some thought and some planning and do you know what so you just said something that, that that's that, that i'm holding on to around you mentioned something earlier about why do people coach the way that they coach i think through this conversation i recognize in myself i'm name checking quite a lot of people and feel like that i've been on this really um unique journey but very intentional about recognizing what i'm picking up from different people and different experiences along the way. Uh, I think that for any coach, recognising like what's rubbing off on you from the different people that you spend time with or are exposed to could have a massive impact on your coaching practice if you're open to try and like look at things which might feel slightly disconnected from your world, but then have a go at have a go at contextualizing it. Yeah. Um uh, you know, it's interesting because I ask that question. It's, it's kind of become a default question I ask every time I'm in front of a group of coaches. So I'm very fortunate to get asked to go and speak at various places and deliver sessions and conferences. But the first, first question that's posed, as a partly as a conversation starter, but starter, but also partly because I'm curious, and I guess I'm I'm conducting a kind of a a Delphi style research experiment. Um, by basically, you know, like every time I'm in front of a room of coaches asking that same question, you know, why do you coach the way that you coach? Now, it's interesting. People don't always take that the right way. Um, uh, but then I, I clarify it by saying, why do you do what you do the way that you do it? 
So the first question, why do you coach the way that you coach, can be quite philosophical and esoteric. Um, and it's a useful question to frame because it's asking people a little bit about their motivations and people often come to me and talk about their motivations for coaching. Useful. And I'm always fascinated by that. But then the second question, why do you do what you do the way that you do it, sort of digs a little bit more into method. Um, why do you choose the method that you choose? Why do you choose the approach that you, you, you choose? And the reason I'm interested in that is because I want to know what the influences are. I want to know where they yeah. stem from. And interestingly, um, as you probably know, I've been on a, a bit of a micro campaign of late talking about coach education and the state of coach education and where coach education could be. And it's interesting that in this conversation, we haven't really talked about formal coach education very much. What we've talked about is your developmental journey, which I described as atypical, because what you've done is you've been able to essentially have the best kind of apprenticeship you've operated within guild almost with other craft people and you've learned from those craft people and you've assimilated some of their ideas and then you've moved to others and assimilated their ideas and you've built up a framework of approaches based on probably the best of what you've seen from multiple craft people that is unique right or i would say that's rare not many people get to have that a lot of people, more often people are coaching on their own and learning through bitter experience sometimes or failures. Yeah. Um, but equally, you know, people do go on formal educational courses. But inter it's interesting to me that whenever I'm asking that question of coaches throughout the world, how rarely they point to those formal education experiences as being formative in their coaching journey. More often than not, it's others that they've had opportunities to interact with, observe, uh, work alongside, um, mimic, they're the stimuluses uh, or their own experiences as participants have shaped them. Either they had a positive one that they wanted to emulate or a negative one that they wanted no one else to have ever again. So they, they're often the drivers and the motivations and then the actual practical method methodological stances is usually harnessed from the best of what they've seen from others. Um, and if you get a lot of exposure, that can be enormously powerful uh, in terms of you developing your craft. But if you don't have the opportunity for that exposure, then it, your ju developmental journey can just be that bit more elongated, truncated, and sometimes difficult. Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. And I think you've, with what you just described there points maybe some differences between coach education and coach development, um, mm -hmm. or the way I would see it anyway, that... That I've been down that coach education pathway through my football journey. And I would say there's some bits which have been absolutely fantastic and some things which have burnt up on re-entry. Um, but I'm sure every coach experiences that to a, a greater or lesser extent on their journey. Um, it goes back to the point I think you were making about more coaches having access to some kind of help or support within the environment that they do their coaching and recognise the fact that there are uh so many volunteer coaches across the uk that it would be unrealistic to think that people could have really broad experiences and connections beyond their sport when they're, vo they're a volunteer and they're only able to give uh two or three hours a week um so if the environment that they're coming to to give those two or three hours a week just helps them develop in one way shape or form then that would be, be better for everybody um I think one of the things that I've noticed from some of the work we've done at UK Coaching is the opportunity to try and make connections for coaches into different sports and different worlds. So you can put the coach in that position of uh, asking that uh, beginner question or the rookie question or starting to look at somebody else's practice but with a fresh set of eyes is such a rich learning experience with the right type of support. Um, but, but maybe it's, it's, it's obviously not, it's not accessible for absolutely everybody to do that. Um, I, I don't really, uh, there's not a specific point I'm trying to make there. I'm just acknowledging the fact it's hard. It's hard for coaches to seek this out. Um, but having people around you who can offer you help on your way is massively important. Yeah. And I, and I guess, um, I suppose it's an appeal really, because, you know, you lead a team that specialize in this you were one of them 
you know, you were one of that team and you now lead a team that specialize in the support and developing, you know, in developing coaches. And often the people who get that kind of support are usually the ones who are in sort of closer to the performance or elite realm. Um, and some of that's to do with the resources that are provided there. And it's also to do, I think, the link to the sort of the pressure strain and some of the acute needs of people in those particular realms. But I believe and have forever and will wang on probably to eternity uh, about this, that the people in community contexts are no no less deserving of that kind of support and have have no less uh, less of a difficulty or challenge in terms of their, what you're operating. You know, um, coaching groups of young people very often with specific needs uh, is a challenging endeavor. And very often it, it, it's given to people who are relatively new and starting out. So you have the rookies coaching the rookies sort of thing. And um, I think that's really difficult. And I think it's a lot to ask of people. And it's no surprise that as coaching becomes, I think, more recognized for the skill set that's required, more and more people are becoming more reluctant to step into it because they're intimidated by the fact that it's quite a challenging endeavor. Um, and I think it doesn't have to be that way, particularly if you've got really good support resources around you. I mean, one of the things I've taken away from our conversation is it's always been one of my, like the first step of the, in my co uh, chairman chair, chair role of the club uh, is, was to make sure that we've got the right people in the right places leading the activities. And then if there's other people helping, then the helper experience is enhanced by the fact that they don't have to be seen as being responsible for leading the activity. So that's the first stage. Second stage then will be to create a community of learning around those individuals and to create a really supportive environment that others would want to be part of, which in, in turn, I hope will, will grow. But I think I'm, I, I guess this is an appeal in lots of ways to you've articulated, I think, very powerfully the impact that coach development can have. And I would like to take that to be the privilege of a few to become the norm for many. But we need to find a way of doing so. Some of that is access to technology, but a lot of it is actually just through this notion of building this cultural expectation about supporting others and equipping people, more of our practicing coaches with the skills to support and nurture others and build their own micro environment. Because environments are everything, you know, so being in an environment that is supportive, I think, is helpful. So I'm, I guess I'm using this platform as a way to say, more of this, please, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. Look, there's no silver bullet for this. And, and it, it's highly dependent on the situation and the context of every coach and then the clubs where they're working. Something that, from experience, I've found really valuable when working with coaches is starting to map like who's in your network, who's available to you to be able to go and access support from. I was over, um, I volunteered for a week in Canada uh, uh, with the week before last, um, supporting um, a group of coaches within a, a club system there. And we spent one evening with some of the female coaches in the club, A, just listening to some of the challenges that they faced through their journey, some of the um, hopes and aspirations for the group of Into the Future. But we, we got some Lego figures, actually. This was where I was flexing some of my coach development skills, bought some Lego figures that they assembled as a, like a, a small avatar of themselves. And then they started to map with Jelly Babies who was in their network, who were the people that they would pull closer to them, but depending on certain situations and then push what impact would that have on the rest of their network and the, I guess, the interconnectedness of, of the stuff that we do. But it helped people start to recognize, well, who's the, who's like the fire starter? In, in in my group who's the person who's coming to me with fresh ideas or I can go to with fresh ideas to really think differently or who's my safety net who's the person I might vent to who's the person who I might see as wise in my network I might go and ask for for some help or have a coaching conversation with and it started to identify a how they could do this for each other with the resources that they had available but also then like where the gaps were and who they might want to go and try and seek out and then lean into the club structure to help them form those connections and I think um for me it helped it i went away reflecting on these this group they've got lots of the answers themselves they just need a little bit of help in in teasing some of it out and actually there's a a, a, a real potential there with the club that they're working in to support them by connecting them to each other or other people externally 
to their environment. Um, but the whole notion of just who, who's in your corner, who's in your network and who do you go to in certain situations, just amplifying that, that message is, is sometimes really powerful. And then they got the opportunity to eat their network with the jelly babies at the end. I was just about to say that your your models didn't last very long, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know what we did? Do you know what we did? And this is this is me. That some some people will listen to this and say, "Oh my goodness, Tom, that's really fluffy." Um, but I quite like it. We we bought a Polaroid camera, and we everybody had a Polaroid of themselves with the the little Lego avatar as a little um, something that hopefully makes the experience sticky. And, and they take home with them. And the person who I was out with in Canada, who was who invited me over for the trip, a guy called Max, um, we were talking about um, memories rather than medals. So at the end of a competition for kids, why don't we do something where children leave with a Polaroid of them and their teammates, and it helps them create a scrapbook of memories through their season that can make really strong emotional connections to their learning points in the year rather than the medal that's not really a very human thing. Um, and I, 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 I know we're going off on a very different tangent here. Again, going back into my time at Arsenal, um, we thought really, really long and hard about the individual development plan for players and how we wanted them to own the process. So we uh, had an experiment one season where we asked the players to come with a picture, which was the front of their plan. And some took it very literally photograph of a player rounding a goalkeeper and some took it in a very abstract form there was an eight-year-old who had a picture of clown school who when quizzed on it said well it's it's i want to learn something here but i also want to have loads of fun um it gave the children the opportunity to um, take more accountability about their development and what they were being intentional about in practice and i i for me the idea of children being able to find create artifacts through their season that helps them look back on the wow and the ouch moments is an incredibly powerful thing. And rather than a coach stepping into that traditional end of season review meeting, giving feedback, the if a child is is empowered and supported to generate some stuff for themselves, then the coach can sit alongside the kid and generate feedback together. And for me, it completely transforms the experience they have and the all or nothing nature of that type of discussion. Oh yeah, I think that I mean that's really interesting. Um God, there's so many things I want to talk about. And that, that's what you said this is a tangent, but this is what I love about these conversations is the fact that we have this opportunity to go down these different different little rabbit holes. The two things I wanted to just pick up on, firstly, um I want to really talk about that being thoughtful about that experience and this notion of memories rather than medals and connections and learning moments and those sorts of things. Um before we get there, though, you talked about this idea of like these Lego avatars. Mm. <laughs> you said before we started uh, recording that you sometimes you clearly clearly do, but you like to be playful in your practice developing coaches. And this, I guess, is an example of that. There's something really interesting because I did some work um, with a um, with Sarah Keller, who's been on the show a couple of times. Um, hockey coach working with Ireland and um, she's a uh, Lego serious play practitioner so you can go on a training course in Denmark with Lego to become a serious play practitioner and um, and she's used Lego as a consultant with us in the past um, and it's fascinating because they talk about this notion of build to think and it is interesting how being playful creates opportunities for people to express themselves and using models and describing the model tells you things about them that they probably wouldn't self-disclose necessarily it's a super powerful learning modality oh my goodness yeah and and that was the first time i met you face to face when you and sarah were delivering a hockey session next to each other and sarah delivered a lego a lego oh, session afterwards i forgot about um, that yes it, <laughs> It's it's such an interesting way to get people to articulate things that they struggle to find the words to articulate. And the build to think space and like the cathartis that comes with just building Lego anyway. Um, we did some things with some coaches about a year ago at UK Coaching where we brought in um, bucket loads of Lego and asked them to build their coaching philosophy. And we spent about two hours on this topic where, A, 
by the nature of doing an activity like that, they sat down next to someone they didn't know and they built some stuff, but they had a conversation. But actually the thing that they created was unique and about them and everything had significance and meaning in there. And even though that they didn't take the models home, they were able to take photos of them and capture them and no, no pun intended, build on it. The next time you came into a conversation, it's incredibly enabling in different ways. And I remember you and Sarah did some stuff around creativity with the hockey sessions and the players were building something through Lego that highlighted their interpretation of what being creative was. Um, many, many ways you could you could use that. But one of the things I love about an approach like using Lego is that there's no right or wrong. And if you're somebody facilitating a session like that, you just need to be curious to ask people to dig a little bit deeper. Um, there's not there's not a checklist of stuff that you have to complete to get through it. And the fact is that that happened about six years ago, that, uh, that that session, and we're still talking about it now, highlights the significance of doing things like that, which are different to the traditional type of experience. Mm, completely. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget, we, we did a workshop, um, this was at, when I was at Sport England, and we're in one of these offices where they've got, they've got glass and people are peering in, and you've got this room full of Lego, and I was looking at some of the quizzical looks that made me laugh. But um, we were doing a thing around uh, some of the barriers for women in coaching, still underrepresented, and um, one of the participants did a, created a model with an igloo. Like, What's that about? So, well, the igloo is represent the the kind of the thing that we need to break in order to unlock the barriers that are in in the place and then through a bit of ongoing conversation we discovered that actually the igloo has a lot of bricks and you could try and break all of them but it would be difficult but if you focused on one you could then make the kind of you could probably put all your energy into one brick and then you could break through it and then you could then start to unbreak break up the other one. So the metaphor from that was that the strategic approach was not to try and solve all the problems, to solve one big one and then begin to then knock off the others, which is like super powerful. I'm like, whoa, God, that's such a clever idea. Uh, just emerged from somebody playing about with some plastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think... You can, you can, there's a contrast here that you can do things which are fun and memorable, and engaging, which people just remember because they enjoyed it. But actually, there's a, there's a deeper truth to it and some real meaning that can, can, uh, unfold or you can make sense of some stuff by going through activity like that. Um, it's, it's almost the ripple effect of this kind of work that is the really important thing rather than the, I guess, the, the bright spot of, of that mm. particular intervention. Uh, Another thing I've played with would be the right word, whether it's been on an FA level one course um, in prison and coaching in Africa was uh, jelly sticks, sorry, jelly sticks, cocktail sticks and jelly beans, building towers, which I'm sure is an activity lots of people have done for lots of different reasons. But we we focused it around uh, the qualities of, of a great coach. So people would spend time exploring it and discussing it and come up with like a diamond line list of what they would describe as some really valuable qualities. But then we brought them to life by blindfolding one person who had to build a, a, a cocktail stick and jelly bean tower whilst the other person coached them through it and helped them. And then we had that reflective conversation about, well, how what, what were you like as a coach in a really difficult situation and what what qualities did you lean into? What did you neglect? And it, it serves both purposes. It makes the coach learning event memorable but it really helps you dig into stuff that you could which is beyond a powerpoint slide mm, yeah 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 exactly um the other thing i wanted to just talk about as well and pick, unpick was um you talked about this in the design of the environment and creating the best experience possible i wonder if we can just dig into that and how did you go about that because i know i can imagine like one of the things that and i know people like to come away with some practical ideas so what sort of things did you do to come up with those ideas? How did you in, how did you sort of like, what sort of things did you do? What worked, what didn't work, all those sorts of things. With the individual development plans? 
Yeah, and and you know, just being intentional about the way that you design that experience for people. Um, well, there's a book which I can't remember the name of now, but it's written by some brothers called Chip and Dan Heath. Oh um, yeah, it's called. Oh, make it stick. Make it make stick. It stick. That's it. It's ironic. I forgot the name of it, right? Um, but <laughs> yeah, it it one of the principles it talks about in that book is around uh, strip away content that heighten experience. And if you were to almost look at the um, the intensity of experience through your practice or your workshop, what are the key moments where you want the experience to be really emotion, a high emotional connection or a low emotional connection? And that for me has really stuck with me when designing these types of activities that are aimed to hook people in. I think from like an individual development plan process and changing it so it, it's not about coaches giving feedback but children own their own development i'm not saying for one second at all let's just throw it over to the kids because they don't know where to start and as my great colleague marianne would talk about it's that you could move from handcuffs to handrails some people need some tighter constraints to help them learn where others need a bit more space and, and freedom so um one of the one of the let's call it an enabling concept that i'm working with with the design of anything like this is that um we need to give some structure to help the learning take place so with yeah. the club i'm doing some working with the players at the moment for their individual development plan we're using kind of a a fifa style uh skills card where the players are scoring themselves out of 100 on a few different attributes now don't tell the players but the score doesn't really matter at all I don't mind if they give them score themselves an 85 or a 25. It's the conversation that that unpicks with the coach afterwards. And something I, something that was brought to my attention that I'd never really thought about before was from the great Stephen Rolnick, um, whose background is in motivational interviewing and po positive psychology. He was saying, well, scales are great because it helps you work out what you need to do to get to the next level. But you can also have that really appreciative conversation about what's sustaining you above the the, the lower score. And, and I think that could be really valuable when you're working with any participant is, and again, using Stephen's language, how can we be treasure hunters rather than deficit detectives? Mm. Um, like as a coach, if you're going into that coaching conversation to say, well, you scored yourself an 80, but why are you better than a 75? Like what are the things that you're, you're doing that, that's keeping you above that? I imagine f would feel quite different to a lot of players who are going through that process because my experiences tell me that those IDP discussions come at critical moments in a season where it's all about being released or being retained. And therefore you're not really having an authentic conversation and they're generally driven by the coach. So to flip it, to say that the child leads it, but the coach asks helpful, curious questions to dig a bit deeper feels more holistic it feels more individualized and actually the with a bit of help the kids know themselves better than anyone and then the masters of their own destiny in this and the coach coach's role is from like the the information giver or the teacher to the to the to the companion or the the champion for that kid yeah i love it love it yeah, I mean, the reason I'm interested is because I've seen lots of different approaches to IDPs and I'm always curious as to how people do it. Um, and, that, you know, they can be more or less formal. So, um, for example, at England Rugby, even some of the sort of aspiring professionals, they had almost like a, a single piece of paper, which was like a collage. It's a collage of images. You know, it's like um, cut and paste from magazines and things. But it was images that told a story about them and their goals and their aspirations and the areas that they intend to focus upon to build on their strengths in order to become or to manifest, if you like, their their aspirations. Um, but it's a visual representation that they then keep and can stick up as a poster and they use it as a mm. reference point, which is tangible and physical and real and is something that they can, you know, others, like you say, you know, it's been things like... Um, selfies and polaroids and creating a series of kind of personalized images that talk about them as humans and family and things that are important to them and the connections that they make and the strengths that they're trying to build i've seen lego models built um that articulate 
their goals. Um, and there's lots of creative and exciting different ways that people have created, um, you know, a, a development plan. But using usually either using a visual, a visual, or uh, a model as a metaphor, uh, or you know, using lots of different creative means, drawings, written PowerPoint slides, lots of different ways of doing it. Um, and I think because when people I think they think of individual development plans, I think they probably think of some kind of Word document with a table. And um, I don't think they're necessarily that no, powerful. No. But I think well, that... things that are much more real and create and created by those individuals, I think, are rich. Are really rich. Yeah, lived, not laminated, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, like something I'm playing with this season, and I, I think I'm working out the readiness factor of the coaches and the children who who we're working with, because let's face it, doing things differently might feel a bit uncomfortable for some people. So. Um, the thing I'm the idea I'm working with is we'll have some points in the season where we'll have those planned discussions with players and coaches where they can bring their IDP and talk about it. But the notion that every child can have three coaching conversations with their coach that they can call at any time, like a timeout. Um, and I like the idea of it unless until someone tells me it's a bad idea. Um, because I want children to recognize when do I want to really engage with my coach and explore this together? Or when can I go and solve this for myself? Or can I, can I go and ask my parents or another teammate or, or, or someone else? So there's some learning to learn stuff packed into the process of kind of calling a conversation um, because it gives children a safe place to experiment. Well, did I really need to use that time out then? Or could I wait till another point in the season? Mm, yeah, I like that. I like that. And the other big thing about that, I think, is that the notion of um, almost being deliberate about creating the space for children or young people to uh, connect. Because it's easy, isn't it, um, for them to just, you assume that you're approachable, but you're not necessarily, you know, you're an, an adult authority figure. And depending on how they, their kind of background and their environment will depend on whether they feel comfortable or confident enough to actually engage with an authority figure. But likewise, um, being intentional about that opportunity, it almost helps the coach to know that that's something that they're providing because it's easy, isn't it, to just get into the doing. And it's enough to try and be managing the session and stop chaos from <laughs> doing and an accident from happening and you can easily just start falling into that that mode and, and not create the space for opportunities for conversation whether it's ses in session or outside of session yeah and it, it's always occurred to me that especially for your grassroots semi semi employed i think the right word part-time coach who's mm -hmm. sessional um if you've got a group of 12 kids and you're having to write individual development plans for them all, that's a lot of heavy lifting. Mm. Whereas if you reposition it and the children own their plan and your role as a coach is different, you might actually get into some better work when you're doing it with them. I think also, and um, without it sounding too meta, like the conversation about having the conversation then starts to come up. Right? You could then talk about, well, do you think that was the right time for us to be able to talk about this thing? Or if you were to have that, that, that discussion time out again how would you use it differently and i think it it starts to uh, provoke lots of different learning that equips the participant for loads of stuff outside of football or outside of the sport um the, the, there's there's so much in it and i think the other thing just just my, where my mind goes around idps and the processes around parents and i know that could be a whole other conversation completely <laughs> but something i've tried to be really deliberate about through this process is um Actually, there's two things. One is parents and helping parents understand the role that they can play, which is beyond a taxi and a bank, but not getting in the way of some stuff that makes the experience tricky to kids. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I think that's really important for coaches to be able to think about and plan for, because if we keep parents too far away, then the distance becomes a problem. And mm -hmm. parents might make up their own mind about what what could be going on, and and lots of uh, room for inaccuracies occur. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so if coaches are really skillful with, I don't know, including parents in the debrief or helping them with the some questions that might start a really productive uh, conversation on the car journey home from training, you, you could really bring parents on as somewhere, an extra person in that grassroots multidisciplinary team. Um, the other thing that, that's in my mind is around helping children or participants work out who they're going to go and ask for help. So um, one of the things we have in our IDP for children in the club where I'm coaching this season is on a monthly basis, we'll ask the kids to think about who who am I who am I getting my help from this month? And in some months, that might just be the same person a few times, but it gives them the opportunity to think think more broadly around it could be the coach here, but there could be a coach in another activity I do could help me with something that draws back into this environment. And for me, asking the question and putting it on the table is a um, an avenue. It's better than not doing it at all, regardless of the outcome. Yeah, I love that. But I've just written something down there, which is a massive takeaway. A parent as part of the grassroots multidisciplinary team. Because you don't have multidisciplinary teams at the grassroots, generally speaking. You don't have psychologists and physiologists and physiotherapists and all those sorts of things. That's the parent, right? They're the medic, the psych, the emotional support, all those sorts of things. So in actual fact, considering the parents as part of your multidisciplinary team is actually a really nice way of framing things. And I get an awful lot of inquiries from coaches about parents and difficulties and all those sorts of things and engagement in that respect i think could be the answer to many of these problems um look we've been going at it for an hour and 20 minutes and i know that you've got a a hard stop uh in a couple of minutes but i just wanted to say thank you very much for joining me It's, it's been long overdue but it's been well worth the wait um and i can feel that there's a lot of other jumping off points that we could uh, go on to so i'd be looking i would if you're willing i'll be looking forward to a part two um, so there's always other things that you think about afterwards. Is there a way people can get in touch with you if they, if any of this has sort of prompted the need for some kind of additional understanding or something along those lines? Of course. Um, part two would be great, by the way. Um, at Thomas W. Hartley, to follow me on X. Um, yeah, that's probably the easiest way to get in touch. And uh, yeah. if, 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 if you're not on there, then um, get on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... That's, that's your DMs lighting up right now. Tom, thank you very much for joining me. It's great. Um, all the best with everything that you're doing with the team. I know they're an amazing bunch of people. Um, and uh, and I know the work you do is really valued and um, and really impactful. And um, the stuff you're doing on the grassroots and the questions you keep posing people, I think, are really powerful. So they've got to, you've got to keep those coming too. Uh, really enjoyed our conversation and um, look forward to part two. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks.